Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to class 105. Uh, this class is on the Adamic myth, and it is part of the continuation of our examination of the various poetic tools that the manifestations use in their scripture. Uh, the uh, Adamic myth, of course, uh, is an allegory. I say, of course, a lot of people, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, fundamentalist Christian denominations, take it quite literally. Uh, so we'll examine uh, a couple of uh, interpretations of what this uh, part of Genesis and the Old Testament may mean. Now, according to some scholars or in some theologians, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were written or revealed by Moses. Uh, but of course, we have no uh, hard proof of that. And even if it were revealed by uh, Moses, it may have been passed down by word of mouth before it was actually written down in, in what was called and still is called the oral formulaic tradition, which is a tradition that tribal communities use for passing their personal and collective history on down from generation to generation. And so one of the, of course, one of the things you find in the Old Testament are these genealogicals, and you find in the New Testament too, these genealogical series of who begat whom and, and how Jesus is related to Adam, for example, uh, in the, the New Testament. Uh, and these were some of the things that the historian of the tribe was responsible for recording and training someone else to do it upon his passing. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to study, and I've studied it in some detail, and uh, perhaps we'll get into it at some point because it is a poetic process. But tonight we're simply looking at the Adamic myth, not so much for its to come to some great conclusion about you know, what its content is about, so much as to show one particular methodology that the manifestations use. If you put together the tools we've discussed so far, such as the questions to ask, the nine modes in which Baha'u'llah reveals, which cover most of the modes that other manifestations use, and the tools we went uh, into some detail to discuss, the metaphor, the symbol, and so on. We're going to continue with those uh, until I'm satisfied that we can simply uh, go from one scriptural passage to another to put these tools into practice uh, so that we may together see how much fun it is, for one thing, and so that perhaps you can, as I've said before, on your own or with a, a few friends, uh, try this process on some prayer or some passage that you think is either uh, perplexing or symbolic. Now, one other thing I'm adding tonight is homework. And uh, uh, since it's a class, why not? And so let me start uh, the... Uh, uh, slides by sharing my screen so that you can see what your homework is going to be. Uh, so this is Symbolic Meanings of the Adamic Myth, class 105, and your homework is the following two slides. I want you, and the way this will work is I'll give you your assignment, and then we will discuss it in the next class Q&A. So in other words, this is your homework for next week, but we won't uh, discuss them. In some cases we will, but most part we'll discuss the answers that you've come up with in the Q&A and not as part of the class. That will give us more time. So I, the assignment is this. I want you to take what is called sometimes the morning prayer or a morning prayer of Baha'u'llah. And I want you to pray it or recite it or intone it in the evening and see what effect that has on the meaning. And then I want you to do the same thing with the midnight prayer. Uh, and this is a prayer by Abu Baha. 
And I want you to pray this in the morning and see what change that has on the meaning of the words and symbols. But let's get to our uh, discussion tonight, the Adamic myth. Um, of course, the, uh, the myth itself is in Genesis, the Old Testament, and it's really told twice uh, in that is you first have the part of Genesis where God brings creation into being. And my own uh, uh, overall sense of this is that this is a mythological or symbolic description of the evolution of the planet uh, or of, of other planets as well, but this is obviously talking about our planet. So we won't read the whole thing, but, uh, and then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land and that bear fruit with seed on it according to their various kinds. And it was so. And the land, of course, this is uh, the creation of the, the heavens, the earth, the land, the vegetation growing but uh, of course the most crucial part of it is where he said uh, uh, that he would bring forth humankind so he created first the uh, creatures of the sea and every living thing and every winged bird according to its kind and god saw that it was good god blessed them and said be fruitful and increase in number and fill the seas in the seas and let the birds increase the earth. Um, and th then he, uh, and, and of course the, the two great lights, the sun, the sun in the daytime, the moon in the evening and so on. Uh, and then th as this goes on, he creates humankind. Uh, and notice the sequence in which these uh, uh, creations are produced parallel pretty well what we know in so far as our own study of the of evolution on earth the sequence in which uh, the various forms of beings came into being from the percolating uh, mass that earth was uh, once it spun off from the sun uh, and so uh, that's why I think it might mythologically be a good way of explaining to people who are unlearned or who have no uh, access to the sciences that we now have to study how this came into being. And so you tell it in a parable or a myth. And then after everything else is created, it's only after that that you have man created. And of course, we're still discovering, as I'm sure some of you have noticed, it happens almost on a weekly basis now, that we're increasing the time that man has endured on earth. We're also increasing our belief in the capacity of those human uh, humanids that preceded Homo sapien. Uh, so even though they weren't uh, the final version of uh, the Homo sapien, they were, you uh, uh, know, preceded us. Uh, they made art and images and so on. So there wasn't some sudden switch where the human being became a human being. It's a gradual thing, as evolution describes. And, but at some point when human beings or the humanid or the humanoid, uh, the, the homo sapien has the capacity, God creates mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, this doesn't mean this happens all at once. Again, this is describing a process that took probably millions of years. But God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over everything else. So God gave man, as Baha'u'llah talks about, the capacity to uh, control nature, 
uh, uh, even though we are a product of nature as well. Now, so this is, if you will, the, the, it's, and it's beautiful poetry, and it's a, a beautiful story. And God said to, to mankind, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit within, uh, with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. And so this are the, these are the six days of creation. And of course, they're not days. They are six stages, if you will, of the evolution of uh, the planet Earth and ultimately the, the fruit of that process, which according to the Baha'i Rhines is the, uh, and the whole purpose which we're going to discuss in some detail, uh, is the purpose of creating humankind. But what we're going to deal with uh, uh, in the classes to come is uh, the parts of, a, of a, a work that I'm putting together, a book called The Mind of God and the Structure of Reality. And what we're going to try to discover as we go along is why does God need to create anything in the first place? If God, as Baha'u'llah said, is self-sufficient, uh, independent of everything in creation, why does he w want to create anything? We'll get the beginning of that in the next couple of classes. Now, so this is the first part of Genesis. So humankind is now made. But this has, doesn't mention Adam and Eve, does it? So the story of Adam and Eve comes after the description of the six days of creation. Uh, and of course, from the point of view of strict uh, fundamentalist literalist interpretations, there really was a man named Adam and his wife Eve, though where did she come from? It, well, she came mythologically from Adam. Uh, and this is where we get into a really uh, challenging part of the myth. So let's look at the myth of Adam and Eve. Though I'm sure you uh, know the story, but uh, we'll look at it as it's told in Genesis or the parts that are important for us. The Lord God said, it is not good for me, man, to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Uh, now, the way I have interpreted this, and you can interpret it how, how, however you wish, is this is a point where um, in the sequence of manifestations, and while Adam is the first manifestation in the Adamic cycle, we are told by Abdu'l Baha there were universal cycles before that, because each time a universal cycle appears, the previous universal cycle is largely uh, vanished from our collective memory or any evidence of its existence. Uh, so Adam is given the task of naming them. The way I interpret this is that Adam is to understand their essential reality. Uh, what call, uh, what um, Nadir Say Saidi in his work calls the thingness of something. It's essential being. Uh, the better word that I like is one that uh, Mujan Momin uses in his works called quiddity. Uh, but you can look up quiddity and see if you like that better. But it means the ontology or the nature of the being of something. So Adam is given the ability, almost in a platonic sense, to study things and decide what they're, not what he will call them literally, but what their reality is about that he is capable of understand of understanding that. So the Adam is not satisfied with 
any of these helpers uh, by themselves. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord gave man a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now my bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Well, um, let's go on before we start discussing what this might mean and uh, see if uh, uh, what occurs next, and that is the fall. Um, and uh, again, I know most of you know the story, but it's worth repeating because it's not told this way in the Quran. It's told a little bit differently. So if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you may not be familiar with the story. Now, the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must? Well, let me see now. Yes. God told him, you may, be, you may eat of all the trees in the garden, and I've skipped that, uh, but you should not take of the, uh, partake of the tree uh, in the middle of the garden. Uh, and the serpent said, did God really say you must not eat from the, any tree in the garden? The woman said, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, so she, she's ambitious, you see. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, ate it. Now, he's going to later, later, he's going as an excuse to God. He's going to say, oh, well, the only reason I ate it was because my wife told me to. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves because they're em embarrassed. So, Abu Baha interprets this uh, parable or this analogy or this, well, that's not right. Let's say it becomes a parable from our point of view, but uh, literally it's a story. It's a, a, a myth that was passed down. So, uh, here is Abu Baha's interpretation. Uh, he says that Adam represents the spirit of Adam that flows through the soul of Adam which is Eve. So the essence of Adam is Eve, and the spirit flowing through Eve is represented by Adam, or the animating force of the soul, whereas the soul is the quiddity or essential self, uh, which emanate from which emanate the mind and all other human powers. The serpent uh, represents generally the ego, but more appropriately, the, the attachment of the ego to the things of this world, whether it be power or riches and so on, sensual delights. The Garden of Eden represents heaven or the realm of paradise. And when they leave paradise, the spiritual realm, they descend into a, a, a physical reality, which is represented by their partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because since there is no evil in the realm of the spirit, then they say, well, let me see what it's, uh, what it's like to know about this world. So again, this is straight from the uh, Some Answered Questions by Abdul Baha. The tree of life thus represents the highest degree of the world of existence, the position of the word of God and the supreme manifestation. So it represents, if you will, that middle line in the ringstone symbol, the, the realm of uh, the highest position. 
we'll get to that later and, and make that clear. And their descent into from their exile from the garden, then, as I said, represents their descent into the physical world because they were in the realm of the spirit. Well, of course, this is confusing from a Baha'i point of view because the Baha'i writings say that we don't pre-exist, that we come into being once we are conceived in the physical world, then the soul emanates from the realm of the spirit and becomes associated with the body during this period of what in one part of the writing is called the earliest years of my life or the earliest days of my life. In other words, our physical life. For the spirit and soul of Adam, when they were attached to the human world, passed from the world of freedom, the spiritual world, into the world of bondage, bound to the earth and bound to the uh, uh, condemnation of, of, of God's uh, uh, curse of them, which we will, uh, God's punishment, we'll get to right in the next slide. And then finally, what is the sin of Adam? Uh, according to Abu Baha, the sin in Adam is relative to his position, although from this attachment there proceed results. Nevertheless, attachment to the earth, earthly world in relation to attachment to the spiritual world is considered as a sin. In other words, if you choose one over the other. Now, in this sense, Adam is representing the totality of humankind. Uh, uh, from Abu Baha's uh, interpretation. So then they are punished, uh, and they have th different punishments. There's a punishment for the serpent, there's a punishment for Adam, and there's a punishment for Eve, and they're all distinct. For the uh, serpent, or the worldliness, or ego, and so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And if we take this literally, it sounds like he's just talking about snakes. But of course, snakes aren't evil. They are animals like uh, everything else. So we, we we are challenged to see what this might mean symbolically. But first, let's look at the uh, the um, punishment for Eve and Adam. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, this is so important if you take it literally because it becomes the basis, particularly when uh, hooked up with Pauline's letters, which are anti-feminist and anti-nomian, uh, to cause for the uh, subservience of women in early Christianity, the inability of women to preach, become figures in the church. Uh, and the belief that women are inferior to men. This all stems from the literal interpretation of this, hooked up with Paul's letters to the Christian communities, where he confirms this, that in effect you have the concept of original sin, that because we are uh, derived from Adam, we are bound in original sin, and until we accept Christ as our Savior, we are in a state of sin. So Christ died to save us from our original sin. Uh, it doesn't make sense logically in so far as what does his death have to do with anything that we have accomplished, or why does it uh, secure us from being sinful? Um, but we'll get to that another time. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, and again, that shows the subservience of the wife to Adam. In other words, you didn't rule over her and say, no, honey, we don't do that. Forgive my flippancy. I, I, uh, uh, it's just that obviously this is not meant to be taken literally. 
and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, of course, that parallels a little bit the Baha'i statement that's also in the Quran, we come from God and unto God do we return. But that's talking about the spirit. This is talking about the body coming from dust and returns to dust. And of course, the body is composed of physical elements. Now, um, we're going to go over these and uh, I will explain the the symbols of these uh, because Abdul Baha does not get into the symbolic meaning of these punishments. But first, let's look at the Quranic version of the same story, because the Quranic and the Baha'i version uh, have uh, Adam as a vicegerent. Now, what is a vicegerent? It's the same as a, ma a manifestation, someone who is representative of the king, or in this case, of God. And this will sound more familiar to you as, as Baha'i teachings. Behold, thy Lord said to the angels, I will create a vicegerent on earth, one who represents me. They said, Wilt thou place therein one who will make mischief therein and shed blood, whilst we do celebrate thy praises and glorify thy holy name? This is all this conversation is taking place in the realm of the spirit. He said, I know what ye know not. Now that's a very loaded passage, meaning I know what my ultimate purpose is, the, in, is doing this is, and you are unaware of it yet. And he taught Adam the nature of all things. Now, this is what I'm talking about is really happening uh, when he, uh, it says in the Old Testament, uh, and he had Adam name things. He taught them the essence of their nature. Then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me the nature of these if you are right. And they said, glory to thee of knowledge. We have none. Of knowledge we have none, save, save that that thou hast taught us. In truth, it is thou who art perfect in knowledge and wisdom. He said, Adam, tell them their natures. When he had told them, Allah said, Did I not tell you that I know the secrets of heaven and earth, and I know what ye revealed and what ye concealed? And then he tells the angels, and this becomes the basis, believe it or not, and not that... Uh, Milton was familiar with the Quran, I doubt he was, uh, but this becomes the basis of Paradise Laws, written by Milton in the 17th century, uh, and that is that Lucifer, as one of the highest ranking angels, becomes jealous when uh, God uh, uh, pronounces that his son will go to earth to save mankind, and he says, why should the sun be uh, more important than me. Well, uh, let me go ahead with the Quranic verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. And they bow down, not so Iblis, so Iblis, who is a spirit, a djinn, refused and was haughty. He was of those who reject faith. We said, O Adam, dwell thou and thy wife in the garden and eat of the bountiful things therein, as where and when ye will, but approach not the, this tree, or ye run into harm and transgression. So we do have the tree, but it's a slightly different situation. Then did Satan make them slip from the garden and get, out, get them out of the state of felicity in which they had been. We said, get ye down, all ye people, with enmity between yourselves. On earth will be your dwelling place and your means of livelihood for a time. For a time, notice. Then learnt from Adam his Lord words of inspiration, and his Lord turned toward him, for he is oft returning, most merciful. We said, get ye down all from here, 
And if, as is sure, there comes to your guidance from me, whosoever follows my guidance on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. But those who reject faith and belie our signs, they shall be companions of the fire, and they shall abide therein. That's Surah 2, uh, and the story is retold in Surah 20. Uh, so let me take a sip of tea here. So this repeats the same story, not the same way it's told twice in uh, Genesis, uh, but uh, somewhat similar to the way it was told in Surah 2. When we said to the angels, prostrate yourself to Adam, they prostrated themselves, but not Iblis, he refused. Then we said, O oh Adam, verily, this is an enemy to thee and thy wife, so let him not get you both out of the garden, so that thou art landed in misery. There is therein enough provision for thee not to go hungry, nor to go naked, nor to suffer from thirst, nor from the sun's heat. But Satan whispered evil to him. He said, O Adam, shall I lead thee to the tree of eternity and to a kingdom that never decays? In the result, they both ate of the tree, and so their nakedness appeared to them. Now, this is very similar, isn't it? They began to sew together for their covering leaves from the garden. Thus did Adam disobey his Lord and allow himself to be seduced. Now, this seems perplexing uh, when we're trying to understand it, because on the one hand, he's a vicegerent, and the, even the angels in heaven are to bow down before him because he has superior authority. Uh, and yet he is still seduced. And of course, we know the manifestation is without sin uh, and impervious to the ego. Uh, and so what could this mean? So let's finish this uh, uh, tell this telling from the Quran in Surah 20. But his Lord chose him for his grace. He turned to him and gave him guidance, talking about Adam. He said, Get ye down, both of you, all together from the garden, with enmity one to another. But if, as is sure, there comes to you guidance from me, whosoever follows my guidance will not lose his way nor fall into misery. And of course, this would be revel the process of revelation. But whosoever turns away from my message, verily for him is a life narrowed down, and we shall raise him up blind on the day of judgment. He will say, O oh my Lord, why hast thou raised me up blind while I had sight before? Allah will say, Thus didst thou, when our signs came unto thee, disregard them. So wilt thou this day be disregarded. Now, um, with the Baha'i interpretation, uh, there is uh, a statement by Abdul Baha at the very end, after he's given this one interpretation of only part of the story of Adam and Eve. And he says at the end of his interpretation, this is only one of the meanings of the biblical story of Adam. Reflect until you discover others. Well, that's something I, I've done and I wanted to share it with you. And I hope you will read it for yourselves and see if you can come up with some others. But uh, the one I've come up with that takes into account the rest of the story, particular the, uh, the cursing, well, what Adam and Eve represent and the ex ex expelling them from uh, Eden and also the particular punishments they endure. So let me get to that. This is John's interpretation. Of course, it has absolutely no authority but uh, it was fun to do. This is my, my chart. Uh, and I haven't put in three uh, columns, but only two. The characters or items in the story and what they symbolize or represent. So, uh, Adam is a manifestation of God or the human aspect of the manifestation. Whereas Eve is the soul, represents the soul which emanates. Uh, and, and it works in both the manifestation and mankind. That's why I've said 
he works he represents in one part of the telling a manifestation or vicegerate of god and the other telling he represents human kind let me explain what i mean there comes a point in the genesis story where adam is alone so part of him is made into something else uh, and my theory is that what it represents is his self-awareness, his soul, which is there, but he becomes aware of it. In other words, he attains self-knowledge, which is a process, no doubt, in the evolution of humankind. It's a, certainly a, one that we've all experienced, where in our lives, we, uh, as youth and children, we don't understand um uh, the difference between our physical self and our spiritual self. We touch our arm, well, that's our self. You know, we look at our face, that's our self. It's only as we get older that we can understand that there is a spiritual uh, existence that from which our thoughts and our reflections emanate that is not coming from our physical self, even though it is employs the brain as an intermediary through which we can express ourselves even as i'm talking to you right now it's not really my brain that's doing that my brain is translating the thoughts of my mind which is a power of my soul into language that i might communicate with you so the eve is latent in adam from the beginning part of Adam. It's already there, but Adam's not aware of it. So he has for a companion then once this takes place and he's made aware, he is enlightened about the true reality of himself as a spiritual being, as an essentially spiritual being that only associates with the Adam that is the physical self. The serpent I have the same as attachment to the human world or the ego, the self, pride, so on. And the garden uh, is the realm of paradise. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is the human world. And so they go from paradise into the human world. Now, of course, as I say, um, as human beings, uh, we don't pre-exist. The manifestation does. Um, and so the angels in heaven bow down before the manifestation because even the angels are of less a station uh, in the heavenly realm. And this is, of course, symbolic because we don't know the various categories of beings that exist in the realm of the spirit. But suffice it to say that we know from the Baha'i writings that the manifestation is far beyond our own station in the next world or that of any other mortal human being. They are not, as we said last time, they are not mortal, normal, ordinary human beings. They are a different order of being. Uh, so even though they have two stations that are described in detail in the Egon, the station of essential unity and the station of distinction, all that is describing is the fact that the manifestations are aware of each other, come from the, from God with the same unified purpose, and they are aware of what their job is in that sequence of revelations. Uh, but they appear at a particular time and place, and they are constrained by the limitations of those to whom they appear and the time in which they appear. So that's what distinguishes them. Plus, they have their own personality and so on, which derives from the fact that they appear in the guise of an ordinary human being, even though they aren't ordinary human beings. The nakedness of Adam and Eve are their essential innocence in the world of the spirit, but once in the realm of the uh, of the um, physical realm, they are tempted to, uh, in the same way, if you'll recall, uh, well, you won't recall unless you've uh, uh, attended the earlier classes, we talked about the temptation of Christ. As soon as he is 
uh, uh, baptized by John the Baptist. He goes in the wilderness for 40 days, and there he is tempted by Satan. And he is tempted to have great power. He is tempted to do all these things. And of course, what that is, uh, as I understand it, as I interpret it, is not an actual Satan or uh, tempting Christ, but it is a way of explaining that the manifestation is well aware of what he could do if he wanted to, because he has omnipotence, he has omniscience, and he can do whatever he wants. So this is a demonstration of the sacrificial nature that they uh, come to earth to exhibit for us, that they sacrifice all the things they could have for themselves in order to serve the purpose of redeeming us gradually. So they, uh, they become aware of themselves, conceal themselves from these. Now, this is referring more to humankind rather than the manifestation. And this is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the most important ways that this interpretation works for me. And that is, Adam's uh, and Eve's punishments are different. Notice Eve is the one who is attracted to having power and to know things because Eve represents the mind, uh, the, uh, the rational self, uh, the m part of ourselves capable of desiring to know things. Uh, Adam, uh, on the other hand, is the body and can be tempted by physical things, such as his relationship with uh, his wife and so on. Uh, are so. On. But notice their punishments are different. The mind must discover the right path and the veiled meanings of Scripture through mental struggle. That's my understanding. So in other words, the spiritual or figurative meaning of bearing children in pain is that uh, it is not easy to understand what the manifestation is teaching us and less easier still to carry them out. That's why the scripture is concealed. And so it is through struggle that our mind will produce the correct understanding of scripture and purpose. Whereas our body is condemned to literally work in order to sustain the mind. Now, uh, notice that Eve he gave into, or let me put it this way, subordinated herself to her physical self. In other words, gave into. Or is I'm not saying that correctly. Eve uh, is um, condemned, if you will, in this sense, to be overruled by her physical. The mind and the spirit are tempted to be overcome by or overruled by their uh, the physical desires and temptations. So the body will turn to the earth uh, and become dust, uh, but the spirit will live on. Now, this again, this is not authoritative in any way whatsoever, but it's another way of looking at this very interesting uh, myth of uh, creation, a creation myth. As you know, tribal communities uh, in various parts of the world have their own creation myths. And they're very interesting uh, and also are very symbolic and allegorical. And we're going to end up with a final uh, image uh, that is from uh, Nadir Saidi's book, uh, Lo uh, Logic and Logos. Uh, um, excuse me, Logos and Civilization. And you, we've talked about, uh, not recently, but you will find in the writings, discussions mentioned often by Abdu'l-Baha of the arcs of ascent and the arcs of descent. What is that talking about? Well, it's very much the creation myth 
wrought into the form of a symbol, so uh, or symbolic uh, configuration. So God brings the creation into being by the manifestation from whose will and determination the destiny of the world is decreed uh, and you have the now this is a descent but it's not the descent in the sense of going from good to bad it's the descent of the will of god in various forms until ultimately it becomes from the letters b and e being joined together uh, conjoined by the manifestation into katab book the revelation at this point the various kingdoms the mineral the vegetable the animal the human kingdoms ultimately the human being begins the journey of what we find in the seven valleys the seven stages of the ark of ascent and so we have the search love knowledge unity contentment wonder and annihilation and subsistence um their titles a little bit differently in the in the seven valleys but it's the same idea and you have the four valleys which uh is society also has in the book uh, that are described uh slightly differently by the bob so this is what is meant by the arc of the will of god descending through various stages until revelation occurs and then you have the ascent of humankind and this of course takes place on an individual and a collective level all right let me stop sharing and that will do it for my uh, presentation.